Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Bytel, and today we're going to briefly step away from electromechanical technology and discuss resumes, cover letters, and interviews, all necessary tools to acquiring a job. Because that's what a majority of you are here for, right? Unless you're a wealthy eccentric that likes dabbling in this stuff, most of us are here to obtain or expand a valued skill set so we can find a rewarding career and earn massive amounts of money in the service of capitalism. The goal of this lecture is to differentiate between resumes and cover letters, learn what to leave in and out of them, how to organize them, how not to wreck a job interview, and how to recover one if you do. Note that the recommendations as presented in this lecture are exactly that, recommendations only. Since fickle, mush-headed humans are often involved in employment decisions, there's a wide range of interpretation about this subject. You might hear different or better advice. This being said, the techniques and layouts as presented in this lecture have helped a number of former graduates land excellent careers. If this works for you, use it. If it doesn't, don't. Because there's a lot of latitude about this subject, I'm going to try something new and actually encourage you to write your own opinions, recommendations, and personal experiences with resumes, cover letters, and interviews in the comments section below. Personally, interacting with other humans via chats and comments is a little weird for me, but I guess that's what people do nowadays, and I'd like this lecture to serve as kind of a tool to help each other out. Again, all of my advice is coming from my own personal experience and that of my students. There's a lot of other people out there that might know better than me. Let us know if you've got additional advice you're willing to share. And away we go. Let's we'll start with a couple quick pieces of personal advice. Recommendation one. Resumes are well-organized statements of measurable facts whereas cover letters are warm, inviting conversations about your admirable personal characteristics with a dedicated purpose of driving the individual reading the cover letter into your resume. Resumes, facts, cover letters, feelings. Do not confuse the two. Cover letters courteously greet the individual reading it and repeatedly push, pull, poke, and drag them into the resume. Recommendation two, treat a job hunt as you would a hunt. Very rarely do hunters go into the woods and just start firing in random directions till they run out of ammo. A far more successful hunting strategy would be to learn about your desired prey, research its specific needs, and craft a special weapon to kill it. Long story short, find a specific job and craft a resume and cover letter for that specific job. If you're applying for a different job that places emphasis on different skills, make a different resume and cover letter for that different job. This does not mean you need to create a different resume from scratch for each and every individual job application, but rather that you should have a master resume from which you can pull specific skills to meet specific needs. Think of this master resume as Batman does the Batcave, which is this giant storehouse of bat boats, bat bots, bat bikes, and bat bombs. When Batman needs to beat the Joker's ass, he doesn't take all that bat shit with him, but he rather grabs what he needs and heads out the door. Using this technique, you should be able to quickly craft a carefully targeted resume from your growing arsenal of skills for specific jobs that place special emphasis on specific skills. For example, if a job application mentions hydraulics, you should be able to scour your master resume real quick and come back with all the skills that place special emphasis on hydraulics. Recommendation three, resumes are living documents that should be updated frequently. As you gain more skills, as you progress through a program of study, take that skill and put it in the master resume for later use. Do this at a minimum annually, and if you haven't done it yet, do it now. Seriously, do it now. As we examine each section in detail later on, feel free to pause the lecture and build or update your resume as you go along. The employed among you are not exempt from this exercise. You might be happy with your job right now, but trust me, one day you won't. Take it from me. I'm happy with my job because I regularly threaten to quit. Capitalism cuts both ways, and if you have a well-documented, valuable skill set, you don't have to work a job you don't like, and other employers might be willing to pay you more for a job you like better. Have a resume at all times. I guess the Boy Scout model sums it up best. Be prepared. All right, let's take a look at resumes first. Resumes are, again, well-organized statements of measurable facts, and all those well-organized statements of measurable fact need to fit on one page. Seriously, one page page. You've got limited exposure time and that resume needs to go off like a flash bang grenade in the reader's face with only the most vital contents burning their eyes and ringing in their ears. All the vital content and resume should be formatted in the following sequence. Contact information, objective, education, work experience, references. Keep in mind the target audience for this lecture series is fresh graduates of electromechanical or mechatronics programs and not experienced professionals. Experienced professionals might use an entirely different format, placing emphasis on different aspects of their professional background. 
Depending on your background, you may also wish to include one or more of the following sections between work experience and references, which can be arranged as you see fit. Instrumentation and equipment, software, certifications and awards, military. Let's take a look at each section in detail. Contact information. Name, Sally, email. Do not include your mailing address. No one is dropping by for tea. Name, Sally, email. That's it. Make sure your email is professional. Chunkylover at hotmail.com. I'm looking at you. Objective. Have a target. Don't shoot randomly. Reference a specific job number. Use items from within that job description to craft this statement. Briefly tell them why you're qualified for this position. For example, XYZ Wind Company is looking for a wind turbine technician in job 1234 that performs maintenance, repair, or replacement of parts to correct malfunctions and troubleshoots complex mechanical, hydraulic, and electrical problems on wind turbines and eligible applicants should have an associate's degree in a technical, electrical, or electronics field from an accredited college or university. Your objective should state, I am applying for job 1234 at XYZ to make the most of my mechanical, hydraulic, and electrical maintenance, repair, and troubleshooting skills I obtained at Columbia Gorge Community College Electromechanical Technology Program. Simple enough. Reference the specific job. Use elements from the job description to craft your objective. Briefly tell them why you're qualified for the job. Education. For fresh graduates, this is the most important section and the single reason an employer might be looking at your resume. For this reason, you should invest most of the time in crafting this section you're liking. I found the most effective way of doing this is simply listing not necessarily course titles, but rather course content. What would generally format education is the school or organization, the program of study, the dates of attendance and anticipated date of graduation, and course content. If you got a good GPA, put it in there. If you don't have a good GPA, don't put it in there. Then comes the laborious process of taking your degree apart and repackaging it for efficient display in a resume. For example, a graduate of the Columbia Gorge Community College Electromechanical Technology Program might package their educational experience like this. As of the time of this recording, the first year of the program consists of Electrical Circuit Analysis 1, Mechanics, Safety, Electrical Circuit Analysis 2, Hydraulics and Pneumatics, Industrial Computing, Electrical Circuit Analysis 3, Motor Control and Mechatronics. And the second year of the program looks like this. Semiconductor Devices and Circuits 1, Digital Logic 1, Power Generation and Transmission, Semiconductor Devices and Circuits 2, Digital Logic 2, programmable logic controllers, industrial control, and all those hippie courses that you need to get an associate's degree, like history, psychology, sociology, and all the other ologies that seem to only produce more ologists. Since the titles of these technical courses may or may not mean anything to a potential employer, you need to take apart each of these classes and put on display the individual skills that comprise them. Consider electrical circuit analysis one. This is introductory DC electrical circuit analysis in which students perform basic soldering and desoldering and learn to use an ohmmeter, DC voltmeter, DC ammeter, and amp clamp, as well as learn to use engineering prefixes, DC Ohm's law, DC power calculations, and build and troubleshoot series, parallel and series parallel DC circuits, use DC electrical theorems, and importantly, interpret schematic diagrams. Do the same thing for mechanics, fasteners, hand and power tools, gears and gearboxes, lubrication, torque and tensioning, shaft alignment, cranes and rigging, and so on. Do this for each and every one of your technical courses and put them in your master resume. Now I know this is time consuming, especially if this is the first time you've done it, and I'm not gonna do it for you, but I can help you out. Open up all the playlists at the Big Bag Tech channel and scan the lecture titles from top to bottom. Open up your textbook and scan the chapters front to back. Open up your notebooks and scan the daily entries cover to cover. You have been taking notes, right? Ideally, this exercise will serve as a memory aid about some of the skills you've obtained thus far. You'd be surprised what you learned. Once you got your master list, you can now pick and choose from it to craft a specific job application. This is exhausting, but trust me, it's worth it. Once you've done it once, you don't have to do it again besides annual touch-ups. Again, resumes are living documents. As you progress through your academic career, you may wish to place less emphasis on certain skills and more on others. For example, if you're in the first quarter or the first year of a two-year program, you need to grab at every tiny straw you can and stuff it in the resume to make it look full. However, if you're in the last quarter on the cusp of graduation with a lot of arms in the arsenal, rather than hauling every exhausting micro skill out of the closet, you might consider including a selection of only the most important topics, which still might be pretty exhaustive in retrospect. Now that you've done that for your primary tactical degree, 
If you've got more than one relevant degree, they're customarily arranged from most recent on top and older as you go down. If the other degree you have is irrelevant to the application, you might want to consider not including it in the resume at all. Again, you've got limited space and exposure time, and the space occupied by a potentially irrelevant skill set might be better put to use to highlight skills relevant to the application. Speaking of irrelevance, do not include high school. No one cares about high school. True story. All right, work history. Similar to education, you would arrange most recent work experience on top and older as you go down. Each form of occupation should be organized as follows. Employer, location, job title, dates of employment, job responsibilities. This is another section that necessitates some time and effort in making each job explode off the page with highly valuable relevant skills. Some of you might be like, get real. How am I going to make my job cleaning dishes, mowing lawns, or slinging drinks to old drunks down at the bowling alley explode? Do not sell yourself short. The fact that you've had any job at all is relevant experience. Seriously, I talk to employers all the time. and The single thing they want the most is someone that can show up on time. If you can show up on time, communicate, work with other people, read a schematic, and use a DMM properly, you are hired. Seriously, at the time of this recording, employers are that desperate for technicians that even your lazy lab partner might land a job. Might. Going back to job responsibilities, if your employment history largely consists of non-technical occupations, this is your chance to emphasize those non-technical skills valued by all organizations and all occupations, namely safety, customer service, inventory management, communication, record keeping and documentation, scheduling, equipment use and maintenance, accounting and the like. For example, let's say you worked in the kitchen at a restaurant. Depending upon your role in the kitchen, you might want to include phrases like managed an effective and productive kitchen environment to meet customer needs, developed and implemented recipes to maintain high standards of quality, maintain current and accurate inventory of food and supplies, ensured compliance with food safety regulations and standards. Notice each job responsibility is not a complete sentence, but rather a brief factual statement about your ability to work in a professional environment, placing emphasis on safety, customer service, inventory management, etc., etc., i.e. the things that all businesses do. This might take some thought on your part, but do not sell yourself short. Way back when, I spent my high school summers mowing lawns and whacking weeds at a golf course. It wasn't exactly the most glamorous job, but my resume made sure to emphasize that this job necessitated I regularly used and maintained hand and power tools, safely store and handle fertilizers, fuels, and other hazardous chemicals, and responsibly operate vehicles, all the while being responsive to customer needs. Now, don't feel like you need to put every job you've ever had in the work experience section, especially if you've got a history of hopping from job to job or getting fired. What you leave out of a resume is just as important as what you put in. This brings us to references. References available upon request. That's all you got to say. Don't waste space on this resume listing them out. This being said, have your references available. Have the most recent contact information and job title for everyone you plan on using as a reference printed on a sheet of paper and bring it with you to the interview. This is like a free extra sheet of paper for your one-page resume. Additionally, let your references know they're being used as a reference. Have the courtesy of reaching out to your present and former instructors, bosses, or coworkers, and let them know you might receive a call from XYZ company about your pending application. This way, when XYZ calls, they're not caught on their heels and talk a good game about what a great student or employee you were. If you don't think a reference is going to give you a good referral, maybe because you're a bad student or a bad employee, maybe don't include them as a reference and find somebody else that can testify you've since cleaned up your act. I wouldn't recommend using friends and families as references, but rather individuals that can comment on direct professional experience. Ironically, one of the best references you can have is a former lab partner that's presently employed at the company you're applying at. Now, I know it's part of my act to regularly roast your lazy lab partner, but when it comes down to it, your classmates are truly the ones that know you best. Can you show up on time prepared? Can you be trusted to help out and not quit when it gets tough? They know. If there's one piece of long-term professional advice I can give you, let it be this. Make sure that you are not the lazy lab partner. Your classmates make great formal resources as you progress through your professional careers. Stay in touch with them. All right, that's the basic skeleton for most people. Contact information, objective, education, work experience, and references. It's up to you to put some flesh on these bones. 
depending on your background, you may also wish to stuff the following sections in between work experience and references, notably instrumentation and equipment, software, certifications and awards, military. Instrumentation and equipment. Since technician work largely revolves around instrumentation, it might make sense to highlight the various equipment you are familiar with rather than burying it in the education section. Of interest to most industrial employers is basic DMM operation, notably ohmmeter, voltmeter, and ammeter mode, oscilloscopes, function generators, amp clamps, and mega ohmmeters. Mechanically, you should emphasize your familiarity with shaft alignment equipment, thermal imaging camera, and hydraulic torque wrenches. Depending upon the job of interest, you may or may not wish to mention specific brands and models of the equipment you have experience with. If you can use a special piece of equipment that not many people know how to use, like fiber optic test or installation equipment, or time domain reflectometer, make sure you state that. That single skill alone might get you the job. Software. The world runs on software, and as with instrumentation, it might make sense to highlight your software experience in a separate section rather than bearing it in education. At a minimum, you need to know how to use the Windows operating system and popular Microsoft Office applications like Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, or their shoddy Google equivalents. Every business uses these types of programs, and you might be the most talented technician out there, but if you can't open or save a file or look something up on the internet without downloading a virus from a porn site, you're not going to get the job. A special word about Excel. This is a very powerful data analysis software tool, and you need to know how to enter and format data, use equations, and display and interpret information in a chart or graph in Excel. If your program of study does not make you take a class in Excel, take a class in Excel or teach yourself. Seriously. This section also gives you a chance to highlight your experience with industrial software packages used to program PLCs and motor drives. For example, you might have experience with following small PLC programming software packages. Tico SG2 client programming software, Siemens logo software, all capitals exclamation point, or Eaton EasySoft software or more robust industrial implementations of PLC programming software like Siemens Sematic Step 7, RS Logix 500, RS Logix 5000, Studio 5000, or whatever version Alan Bradley and Rockwell Automation is charging you a lot of money for the privilege of using. Throughout your educational experience, you might have also been exposed to circuit simulation software like Multisim or Automation Studio, computer programming languages like Python, C, or Java, and hardware definition languages like VHDL or Verilog, as well as field programmable gate array programming software like Xilinx Huvato or Altair Quartus, or excuse me, Intel Quartus Prime. Even if the employer in question doesn't make use of these specific software packages, the fact that you've had some experience at all demonstrates you're at least familiar with this type of software and theoretically can adapt to a different version with relative ease. Certifications and awards. If you possess unique certifications or awards, it makes sense to highlight these in the special section rather than bearing them in educational work experience. Examples include, but are not limited to, OSHA 10, First Aid CPR AED, Forklift Certification, CDL or Commercial Driver's License, Network Plus, etc. Even if the certification in question is expired, it makes sense to draw attention that you once were certified to prove you're trainable. It may sound funny, but if you are an Eagle Scout, put this on your resume and you will get a job. Seriously, 1% of 1% of American youth get this award and people recognize it. Military. If you're a civilian, go ahead and skip forward a couple minutes and I'll be right with you. Go on, I'll be right there. Don't worry. All right, now that we're all alone, civilians, am I right? They're like cats. Ignorant, contemptuous, and at times hostile towards the armed services, yet at the same time, utterly dependent upon us. Don't get me started on those pathetic multicam marshmallow gun-humping LARPers. Anyways, civilians have no idea what we do, so you gotta explain what you did in terms their soft little smurf heads can understand. First off, no acronyms, no MOS, no NEC, no AFSC. You gotta spell out your military experience using words they understand and place it in a format they can read. Easiest way I've found to do this is to treat your military experience as if it was a work experience. A work experience that went on and on and on and on and on and followed you around all day every day and continues to do so even now. But I digress. Organization, duty station or places of deployment, dates of enlistment, job description, job responsibilities. As with work experience, you need to list your job responsibilities as if they were skills desired by technical employers, notably the ability to work with others, inventory management, communication, record keeping, documentation, scheduling equipment use, and maintenance and the like. Very rarely will a civilian employer ask you to call for fire on troops in the open, 
but you should strive to package an experience like this as communication within a hierarchical organization following established procedures to accomplish a desired mission. Fire for effect. Again, this lecture's intended audience is the typical 20-something enrolled in electromechanical technology programs that most likely was an enlisted soldier, airman, sailor, marine, or coastie that served maybe a four-year enlistment term and not lifers or high-ranking officers, warrants, or NCOs. If you got a lot of military experience or perhaps served in a very specialized occupation, Navy divers, I'm looking at you, you might seek better guidance elsewhere. Regarding organization, it's probably a waste of space to drill down to platoon or squad level, but rather keep it at division, potentially dabbing all the way down to battalion level if you served in some multidisciplinary brigade combat team. Additionally, you might want to include notable awards or certifications like Airborne, Air Assault, Combat Lifesaver, or CIB. Additionally, it needs to be stated that if you're dishonorably discharged from the military, do not put this section on your resume. All right, civilians, I'm back. You guys did such a good job supporting the troops. Those bumper stickers with yellow ribbons really helped out. 